so hello everybody i'm scott marble i'm the chair of the school of architecture uh and um this is a it's a, this is a kickoff of our um spring uh event series uh and we're gonna get off to a great start here it's this is our uh annual lecture uh featuring our portman price critic uh and we're thrilled this year to have uh mario gooden uh mario is is this year's uh uh portman prize critic um, and Mario is going to be spending some time at the school. Um, in addition to this lecture, uh, uh, as most of you know, he'll be working throughout the semester uh, with the uh, teaching team for the Portman Studio in our master's program, uh, David Yoakum, Jude LeBlanc, uh, Heather uh, Potts, and Charles uh, Rudolph. Um, and we'll say a couple of words about the Portman Prize Studio. Um, since its inception in 1999, I believe, it's, we've been doing this for quite a while, uh, the Portman Prize Studio um, program uh, has really evolved into, you know, the kind of flagship studio of our Master of Architecture program. And um, it would not be possible, of course, without the, the, the longstanding and really generous support of Portman Architects. Uh, the program uh, was named in honor of John Portman, uh, and has been supported by uh, many people from the Portman leadership team over the years. Uh, and most recently, Rob Halverson, uh, who also recently was named president and CEO of Port uh, Portman Architects, has been our liaison and has provided enormous support. So, so thank you, Rob, and thank you uh, to, to the entire Portman team uh, for making this, uh, making this Portman Prize program uh, possible and for all the support that you've given us over the years. So let me uh, say a few words about Mario. Uh, I've known Mario for quite a long time. It's really great to have you here, Mario. Um, and, you know, I've seen his career evolve and transform and twist and turn over the over the years uh, since we were at Columbia together. Um, and he wears, uh, Mario really wears many hats. Um, he's an architect. Uh, he's the founding principal of Huff Gooden Architects. Uh, he's a teacher. Uh, uh, shortly after graduating from Columbia, uh, he started teaching and is currently an associate professor uh, at uh, Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. Uh, he's a researcher, uh, uh, along with Mabel Wilson. Uh, he's the co-director of the Global Africa Lab, uh, which was started in 2012 um, at, at GSAP. Um, and he's a writer. Um, most uh, recently authored the book, Dark Space, Architecture, Representation, Black Identity. Um, as I mentioned, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that he's done throughout his career. Uh, I don't know if he talks about this much anymore, but I think it's at some point he spent some time in Stephen Holt's office in New York, uh, working uh, in that office, and also in Zaha Hadid's office in, in London uh, before he started his own firm. So he, he's, he's done quite a bit. Um, Mario's work um, e examines, very often examines um, uh, art and architecture uh, and the spatial politics of race, class, gender, and technology. Um, his work, uh, and especially I think his most recent work, uh, calls on, on many adjacent disciplines to architecture, including art and literary theory, philosophy, and performance, which will be apparent shortly. Um, and he looks at these disciplines, I think, to uh, gain a deeper understanding of and a way to contextualize the discipline of architecture. Um, we were, as I mentioned, we were both at Columbia, both as students and professors during a time when uh, when this kind of cross-disciplinary discourse was really part of the core curriculum, uh, where history and theory courses were really as present uh, as design studios running almost parallel throughout the curriculum. Um, so this this foundation of his education, I think, has circled back around to play a pivotal role uh, in his current work. Um, a couple of recurring themes in Mario's work that, that I want to mention. One is just the interrogation of space. He, Mario constantly talks about space. Um, and I think he, when he refers to space, it's both in its kind of architectural meaning, but also in its kind of political and anthropological uh, uh, meaning. Um, and he's constantly kind of pursuing and redefining what it means to have a spatial practice. Um, and, um, and the way that I interpret that is, is that he's continually kind of uncovering uh, the layers of meaning uh, uh, that give us ways to understand 
uh, and then as practitioners to create space. Um, Mario has also always been interested in alternative representations of space, uh, which I think you will definitely see in his presentation, uh, but also is apparent in his current work. Um, he's currently part of a group show at uh, the Museum of Modern Art uh, uh, exhibition, Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America, where he's one of 10 teams uh, that are looking at different cities across the U.S. Uh, to examine um, uh, conditions that have structured and continue to inform the built environment uh, of American cities through public policy, through planning and architecture with specific repercussions uh, for African-American and African diaspora communities. So, um, and Mario's team, I think, is looking at Nashville. He might, may or may not talk about that. Um, I could go on and on, but I, I should stop and let Mario's uh, show start. Um, but just in closing, uh, Mario, I, I know that you, uh, when we talked uh, last semester about you coming to Georgia Tech, you had a lot of offers to do many things across the country, and you were in, in really in high demand. Um, and uh, uh, I just want to uh, say that we are uh, really uh, glad that you uh, decided to spend time with us uh, in addition to your regular teaching uh, and research at Columbia, and uh, it's a real honor that you, that you chose to spend time with us. And it means a lot to our entire community, uh, and it means a lot to me personally. So thank you uh, and welcome, Mario. Um, and just to mention to everybody, uh, the first couple of minutes of the of the Mario's show, I'm calling it a show, uh, will just be sound, no video, so don't think anything's wrong. Just um, uh, put your seatbelts on and uh, welcome to the ride, okay? Mario.
interior rank module, endurance. The last communications came through. Years of basic data, no real surprises. Still looks good. Drawing on a whiteboard, she's coming up fast with one complication. Planner is much, planet is much closer to Gargantua than we thought. Gargantua, very large black hole. And the planet is on the horizon. Basketball around the hoop. Landing there takes us dangerously close. Black hole that big has a huge gravitational pull. It's not that, it's time. That gravity will slow our clocks compared to Earth's. And drastically. Every hour we spend on that planet may be seven years back on Earth. That's relativity. How far off the planet do we have to stay to be out of the time shift? Just back from the cusp. So we track a wider orbit of Gargantua parallel with the planet, but a little further out. Take a ranger down, grab samples, debrief, and analyze back here. Factor in orbit of Gargantua. Minimal thrusting, conserve fuel, but stay in range. Exterior, black hole, Gargantua, day. Black sphere, sucking light from the cosmos. Visible by its distorting effect, the light of the stars behind it. Squeezed into a glowing curved horizon. Endurance approaches. Interior Ranger cockpit. Day. Looks out at Gargantua. Peers over his shoulder. Literal heart, heart of darkness. But. Ready. Exterior endurance. Continuous. Detaches from the ring module like an X1 from a B29. Fires retro thrusters to slow and rocks. Exterior black hole, Gargantua, day. Shoots down towards Gargantua. If we save the planet, have a society of inequality, we wouldn't have saved much. According to Audre Lorde, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They are too narrow and thus assume that people of color have nothing to say about race, gender, sexuality, and the earth, all of which are interconnected. helpful to think of the four coordinates of an event as specifying its position four dimensional space called space time but space time is not flat it is curved or warped by the distribution of mass and energy in it the mass of the sun curves space time in such a way 
but although the Earth follows a straight path in four-dimensional space-time, it appears to us to move along a circular orbit in three-dimensional space. Light rays, too, must follow this rule in space-time. The fact that space is curved means that light no longer appears to travel in straight lines in space. So general relativity predicts that light should be bent by gravitational fields. This means that light from a distant star that happens to pass near the sun would be deflected through a small angle, causing the star to appear in a different position to an observer on the Earth. Black holes ain't so black. A black hole is a set of events from which it is not possible to escape to a large distance. The boundary of the black hole, the event horizon, is formed by the light rays that just fail to escape from the black hole, hovering forever just on the edge. It's a bit like running away from the police and just managing to keep one step ahead, not being able to get clear away. They say our people were born on water. When it occurred, no one can say for certain. Perhaps it was in the second week, in the third, but surely by the fourth, they had not seen their land or any land for so many days that they lost count. It was after fear had turned to despair, and despair to resignation, and resignation to a body understanding. The teal maturity of the Atlantic Ocean severed them so completely from what was once had been their home that it was as if nothing had ever existed before, as if everything and everyone they cherished had simply vanished from the earth. Nicole Hannah-Jones, 1619 Project. T plus seven, NASA, initiation of vehicle roll program. T plus 11, pilot, go you mother. NASA, reminder for cockpit switch configuration change. Local, vertical, local, horizontal. T plus 19, pilot, looks like we got a lot of wind here today. T plus 20, yeah. T plus 22, it's a little hard to see out of my window here. T plus 28, pilot. There's 10,000 feet in Mach 0.5. That's a altitude and velocity report. T plus 30. T plus 35. 0.9. That's a velocity report. 0.9 Mach. T plus 40. Pilot. There's Mach 1. That's a velocity report. Report 1.0 Mach. T plus 41. Going through 19,000. T plus 43. Okay, we're crawling down. That's it. SSME, thrust reduction for a maximum dynamic pressure region. T plus 57, throttling up. T plus 58, throttle up. T plus 59, roger. T plus 60, feel that mother go. T, T plus 60, woo hoo. When Turner exhibited this picture at the Royal Academy in 1800, he compared it with the following extract from his unpublished, unfinished poem, Fallacies of Hope. 
a lot of hollow hands, bright, hot mass and belay, got angry setting sun and fierce dead clouds, fair the Titans cut. Lord sweet short decks, throw overboard the dead and die, near heed their chain, hope, hope, delicious hope, where is thy market now? The Kim and Jacobs Company compelled to present the most astounding and important painting show of the fall art painting season. Collectors of fine art will want to see the latest catalog of armory. What is she offering? But the finest selection of artwork by a Captain America living woman artist this side of the city. Modest collectors will find her price as reasonable. Those of healthcare disposition will recognize the bargain. Scholars will study to make the historical value and intellectual merit of Marvel's mercenary tactics. Modern historians will wonder whether the work represents a departure or continuity. Students of color will eye her work with suspiciously and exercise their free right to culturally allow her on social media. Innocent children and school teachers will re examine their art history curricula for students and academic society. Draw their support. Former husbands and former lovers will recoil in abject terror. Critics will shake their heads in huge silence. Gallery directors will wring their hands at the sight of the from the gallery curious, flooding the pavement outside. The final president of the United States will physically win. Empires will fall, but which one only time will tell. No time for self pity, no road for death. Morrison continues, this is the first step of a despot, an instinctive act of malevolence, not simply mindless or evil, they are also perceptive. Such despots know very well that their strategy of repression will allow the real tools of oppressive power to flourish. Their plan is simple. One, elect a useful enemy, and other, to converge rage into conflict, even war. Two, limit or erase the imagination that art provides well as the critical thinking of scholars and journalists. Three, distract with toys, dreams of loot, themes of superior religion or defiant national pride that enshrine past hurt and humiliation. The nation could never have existed or flourished in 1940s Spain. 
2014 Syria or apartheid South Africa or 1930s Germany. The reason is clear. He was born in the United States in 1865, year of Lincoln's assassination. Political division was stark and lethal. During, as my friend said, times of dread. No prince or king or dictator could interfere successfully, successfully or forever in a country that seriously prized freedom of the press. That is not to say that there weren't elements that tried censure. They could not the long haul win. A nation with its history of disruptive, probing, intelligent essays, sharing wide space equally with art criticism, reviews, poetry, and drama, is at a cru- as, as crucial now as it has been for the last 150 years.
Amy Livingston and two younger sisters walked ten blocks from their East Baltimore home to Clifton Park Municipal Square. The three had never plunged into the pool, even though they had grown up so very near it. Amy did not expect to enter the pool that day either, but she hoped. A rather rude attendant turned the girls away with scorn, according to Amy, but added that the city would soon build a pool nearby that they could use. Amy eagerly waited out the summer and her senior year at Carver High School, but she saw no evidence of a new pool. In 1953, she wrote to the Afro-American, Baltimore's leading black newspaper, asking if it knew what had happened to the pool of black swimmers. As of yet, she lamented, we had heard nothing more of this. At the end of her letter, Amy linked the lack of an accessible municipal pool to the larger issue of civil rights. If this country is ever going to have equal rights, why not start here? For her, equal rights was not an abstract principle. It meant having a pool in which to swim, like her white neighbors. Baltimore operated seven outdoor pools at the time, six for whites and one for blacks. The whites only pool were distributed throughout the city, in Druid Hills, Patterson, Clifton, Wins Falls, Riverdale, and Roosevelt Park. Most were resort pools with large tanks, concrete decks, and sand beaches with grassy lawns. In contrast, the city's only municipal pool for blacks, located in Druid Hills Park, was quite small, according to the Department of Recreation. By the birth of the world, no business. Mamie's letter is the paper to investigate the city's pool building plan, so it publicized the unpool division. Shortly thereafter, three black boys drowned in two separate incidents while swimming in natural waters around the city. One incident, Tommy Cummings and Bernard Hipkins were swimming with two white friends in the Pasco River when Tommy slipped beneath the water and never came back up alive. The surviving trio explained that they swam in the river because it was the only place in the city where they could all swim together. During the hearing in 1954, city solicitor Edwin Harlan argued that the racial segregation must, uh, must continue at swimming pools despite the Supreme Court's recent ruling in Brown v. Board of Education that school segregation was unconstitutional because swimming brought males and females into physical and intimate contact. We're moving to higher ground. America's hero of climate migration is here. The enormous migration will probably take place over a longer period than the dust bowl, but its implications are both profound and opaque. It will plunge us, the U.S., into an utterly alien reality. The closest analog could be the Great Migration, a period spanning a large chunk of the 20th century, and about 6 million black people be part of the gentle south, where cities in the north, midwest, and west. The Great Migration was out of the south and into the industrialized world. Whereas this, every coastal place in the U.S., and every other place in the U.S., not everyone can afford to move, however, so we could end up with a trapped population that would be in a downward spiral. White New Orleans has recovered from Hurricane Katrina. Black New Orleans has 26,000. That's how many fewer African Americans are living in New Orleans. Now more than 14 years after the storm. Nearly one in three black residents have not recovered from any after the storm. Katrina was not an equal opportunity. That wasn't due to bad luck, but because of racially discriminatory housing practices, the high ground was taken by the time banks started loaning money to African Americans who wanted to buy a home. Nor has New Orleans experienced an equal opportunity recovery, in no small part because of the white civic leaders who openly advocated for a whiter, wealthier city. Amistad Opera in two acts. Music by Anthony Davis, libretto by Filani Davis. Act one, theme one, unknown is my realm. The Spanish schooner Amistad out of Cuba drifts off Long Island. The ghost ship is legendary, taken over by slaves, haunting eastern waters. Board ship is one who shapes their fate, a ragged, boastful African deity. The trickster god, Esu, is the spirit of rebellion, certainty, and mischief. He is the god of the crossroads, 
mediating the human and the divine. When humans meet him, they are apt to lose their way. Yet, ironically, he holds the key to their survival. This trickster has led, has been led astray himself. Fortress middle passage journey has nearly blinded him and weakened his powers. The trickster claims that he will yet prevail, but ask for help from the goddess of the waters. Theme two, cloth for the dead. The trickster hears the ship's two hostages, a navigator and a slaver, scheming. They tie the hell on a northerly course, as they have every night. The African leader Senke discovers the trick and realizes that they have not headed to Africa, but zigzag northward to another fate. The ship runs aground, and enterprising seaman discovers them and seizes the ship to sell the Africans as salvage count cargo. The two Spaniards tell of mutiny and murder and claim to own the Africans. This, they are free. Thinking believes they are victims of the Mende taboo. To see a god can bring danger. Antonio, a lifelong slave, witnesses the mutiny, and he has fears too. Theme three, savages of legend. Newspaper reporters watch the captives being raided to jail and joust for their lot. The reporters inflame the, the American course into a racist tirade, culminating setting foot on American soil seems to restore the god of chance and scares the Africans. Dean four, ankle and wrist. As Americans gawk at the jail captives, Margu tells of her capture. The captives vow not to reveal where they are from in order to protect their family. Denke recalls being in a net. A phrenologist measures the skull of the Mende prisoners and renders his findings to the press. Dean five, the greatest liberty. Abolitionist Tappan comes to plead with Adams, act as the lead lawyer for the African. The former president resists because he has not been in a courtroom in years. He then muses on the young republic's visions of liberty. Act two, scene one, posers, dandies, and hats. The reporters introduce the cast at court. Scene two, what the navigators saw. The navigator tells of walking to the, to the touch of a blade. Scene three, President's parlor, a foreign appeal. The president and the Spaniard ought to sneak the captives to Cuba if the Africans should win in court. Scene four, what Antonio saw. Antonio recounts the captain's death. The court turns against the Africans. Scene five, they saw a god. The captives say the story begins in Africa. Scene six, skin of the clouds. The goddess of the waters, invoked by the tale, recalls the middle passage. Scene seven, Prayed by the Lord and Chief. The captives describe, describe upon how landing in Cuba, the seeds of their revolt are sown when Antonio rebukes the trickster, and the cook threatens the captives. Antonio tells them that they are now in a new world. Scene 8, The Rising. The trickster frees the captives and starts a revolt. Dinka decides to spare Antonio. Scene 9, Bird on a Wing. Adam sums up before the court and the judge renders his verdict. The captain's case, the captive's case is won. The trickster reveals to Senke his decision to stay in the Americas. The captives are free to return to Africa. Collection Overview, Virginia Key Beach Trust Oral History Collection, 2004 to 2005. Open contents of the materials. The Virginia Key Beach Park Trust Oral History Collection includes VHS tapes, DVDs containing interviews from activists and citizens who participated in or experienced the 1945 foundation of the segregated Virginia Key Beach current restoration through the Virginia Key Beach Park Trust. Interviewees discuss their personal beliefs, political activism, and current issues involving the restoration and preservation of the beach. Each person uniquely recounts their personal experiences and histories about the beach, including, including stories about relatives, friends, both political and personal battles, and segregated climate. Each interviewee tells their story of the park in a unique, engaged way, offering a personal and detailed account, as well as a plan of action to implement a museum 
rejuvenated historical environment at Virginia Key as a cultural reminder of the past. Item one, Enid Pinckney interview, 2005. Growing up in Miami, Pinckney enjoyed school at Booker T. Washington High School. The church movies cluttered her and her friends' leisure activities. She often interacted with whites naturally, but was aware of the segregated nature of Miami. Some friends, some family friends lived in Miami Beach, were treated poorly. However, her friends and her colleagues knew their rights and fought with hope. She participated in the Native of Dade organization and was part of the Integrated Methodist Church. Pinckney discusses Father Comer at the St. Agnes Episcopal Church, which began a civil and voting rights movement. Pinckney recalls memories at Virginia Key Beach with her church for baptisms in the ocean water. They brought their own food and enjoyed recreational activities at the beach. They had a sense of pride and ownership of their colored beach. Pinckney doesn't believe that the beach was simply concession or a negative experience. It was a positive experience, which much to be gained from the restoration to the previous state of the beach. She advocates for historical respect and further equality through the beach's museum. Pinckney, an active historian, mentions the renowned Hampton House, a black-only hotel where Martin Luther King Jr. stayed. The hotel would be preserved by Virginia Key Trust, Pinckney's organization. Item 2, Greg Bush interview, 2005. Dr. Greg Bush, a restoration historian in charge of much of the political maneuvering and logistics of the restoration project, discusses the various environmental battles in Florida at the end of the 20th century. His environmental preservation efforts began in 1996 with the Urban Environment League, which battled against losses of natural spaces in urban environments in Miami. He details the battles and demonstrations of 1999 attempts about demolition and development in Miami. He worked hard against a committee intending to demolish Virginia Key Park. Later, he designed a shred to help restore Virginia Key Beach, contacting advocates of both civil rights and property preservation. He strategically created a coalition to preserve environment and history using the press to get out the news. Virginia Key is a site of African religious and social life, but respect for the land is also important. Considering the composite ideas of many people, it is an intergenerational area. Item 14, Edward Joseph Ryan Jr. Interview, 2005. Ryan, born and raised in Miami, recalls the horrible conditions during segregation. He and his friends would run to elementary school in order to escape the taunts from whites. His mother always emphasized the importance of education, and in 1946, Ryan went off to college in Washington. He did not return to Miami until 1956, after Virginia Key Beach was open. While in school, his mother wrote to him about members of the NAACP who planned an incident in May 1945 where they would go to the waters of Baker's Hollow. His mother, an NAACP treasurer, gave a lawyer enough money to bail them out of jail in case they were arrested. None of the seven participants that waited in were arrested, but after the incident, there was a meeting and the Virginia Key Beach Park was officially made into a colored-only beach. When he returned home, the beaches were always crowded and everyone enjoyed it. The bridge was built in 1947, and although most blacks did not have cars, they would wait for a large truck to drive them across the bridge. Everyone found a way to this important community's place. He wants the sacrifices of these seven individuals to be remembered as the beach is restored. Item 18, M. Atheley Range, interview 2005. Range's father worked in South Beach, and as a young child, she faced the many elements of segregation against her parents. Her first experiences at the beach were for church picnics, where Range's family and friends had to travel north to the beach in a truck. Bears Cut was the first island in Dade County where blacks could swim. Memphis Press Gimmicker published this account. 10 a.m. at Brooks Memorial Art Gallery in Overton Park, where Thursday is Negro Day, and usually, according to directors, very few take advantage of it. Four boys and three girls entered, asked to see the Mid-South Art Exhibit, were directed to the basement where it is, were standing there examining the exhibits when police arrived and suggested they leave. These all stood mute, were taken to jail. Six others standing outside were also taken to jail. 
Those who got inside of Brooks were charged with loitering, disturbing the peace, disorderly conduct, and threatening to breach the public peace. They were Darnell Thomas, 21, Gene Bonds, 24, Joe Iris Smith, 21, Virginia Owens, 23, Jesse E. Jones, 21, Ronald Hennington, 24, charged with loitering for Howard Ramsey, 24, Johnny Naylor, 22, Benny Johnson, 21, Gene F. Brown, 25, Clary Avon, 21, and Steve Tyler, 21. An undated map of this historic area in St. Petersburg, known as Methodist Town, the gas plant district, Pepperstown, Cooper's Quarter, and Jordan Park, along with their relationship to the 22nd Street South Florida Business District. Although de facto segregation is known to have occurred in St. Petersburg as early as the end of the 19th century, the first attempt at de jure segregation took place in the 1913 election for city commissioner in the form of an all-white primary, which was widely used throughout much of the South at the time, to ensure that only candidates with a strong white following would appear on the final ballot. The purpose of the all-white primary was to prevent African Americans from voting during the primary election, thereby automatically eliminating candidates with a strong black following. In St. Petersburg, the rationale behind this decree was stated in the following words by the editor of the St. Petersburg Independent during the lead-up to the election. The Independent doesn't care a rap who the city officials are, just so they are good and competent men and give the city a good administration. But it is in the interest of the white people to control the city affairs. Whereas the all-white primary may have had some impact on the black community, the former threat segregation law that undoubtedly had the greatest impact was the one that dealt with racial zoning, which also appeared in the city charter in 1931, and remained in the charter following form until it was removed in 1971. Degradation of races. To establish and set apart the said city, separate residential limits for districts for white and Negro residents. To designate, establish separate and set apart territorial limits for districts of said city within which white persons may reside. Separate territorial limits for districts of said city within Negroes may reside. Separate and separate white persons from taking up or establishing a place of residence or business within territorial limits of the city set aside and established for the residents of Negroes, and to prohibit any Negro from taking up or establishing a place of residence or business within the territorial limits of that city, no set on separate and for residents of white persons. 22nd Avenue South in St. Petersburg is better known as the Deuces, the historic part of the city that kept the 1960s African American community together. In 1962, one could step out of the door, cross the street, and get a shoe shine at the cozy end, have lunch at the shag, and later get a haircut at Oscar Fleckers. You could visit your attorney and buy groceries at Barco's store. Up to air could examine you, and if it was too late for that, funeral arrangements could be made at the Arch Royale. However, at the time, the area lost its part. You can ask someone like Gloria Campbell, who has kept her business on the 22nd Street corner for the past two decades, about the change. Segregation in the interstate basically killed the area, she said. Ralph Allison defines jazz as an impulse, a constant process of redefinition. The jazz artist constantly reworks her network on three levels, as an individual, as a member of a community, and as a link in a chain of tradition. Nothing is ever given. Who you are, the people you live with, and for, the culture you bear, everything remains open to question, to probing, and to re-evaluation.
Thank you very much. So thanks, Mario. Um, uh, I'm gonna. Um, think it was very. I'm, I'm. I'm sort of my head is spinning in terms of of questions, and I'm sure there's going to be questions coming in. But um, I'm gonna. I want to introduce David Yoakum. Um, uh, David, um, as many of you know, is coordinating the Portman Studio and is working closely with Mario this semester. And David will kind of uh, um, moderate the Q and A. So uh, feel free to to ask questions. And uh, I'll hand it over to David to uh, 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 to, to moderate and, and lead the Q and A. All right. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Mario. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, just fine, David. Okay, uh, Mario. That was that was incredible. It was awesome. Um, I'm really feeling uh, very uh, overwhelmed in a, in a great way. And. Um, I just wanted to thank you. Um, it, that, that's a that's an amazing amazing presentation. I want so uh, while folks um, can can type in some questions, I I wanted to share some questions we received during the lecture. Okay, and and this is sure. how they came. In. The first one came in at 4:30 p.m. and it was simply a question mark, and I thought that was good. <laughs> And then the next one that came in 10 minutes later was, could you turn, could you, could you guys turn the music off? I can't hear any spoken words. Well, I could hear your words fine, Mario. Um, and I, and I, and I really appreciated the way that you were layering things. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The next question came in about 60 minutes later. Can you please turn the volume down? I want to hear the words. So we, <laughs> and then, then this is my favorite. At 4.57, a, a, a question came in that said, will there be a lecture? <laughs> and so I want to stop there while folks ask some, some more questions. But Mario, just to kick things off, I, I really felt that it was uh, incredible. I, I just kind of sunk into everything that you were showing us, kind of letting it wash over me. It was very immersive and intense. Uh, I thought the audio mix it was perfect. Um, there's a lot of collapsing of image and time um, and of history in the present. And what we want to see and what we didn't know was there of place and performance, sounds that are loud, maybe sounds that we can't hear, but we should. And it's generally a feeling of all things at once. And I wondered if you could just, as we kick things off here, if you could talk a bit about the importance of simultaneity and juxtaposition in the way that you see the world and the way that you make things. Yeah, well, I think that um, for one thing, uh, and let me just actually start by thanking Scott for that incredibly generous introduction. Um, yeah, Scott and I go back quite a long time and um, Scott was exactly right in terms of our education and the interdisciplinary nature of that. Um, at this time, as we have observed over the last year, but I would say even more than the, than the last year, um, you know, along with the confluence of pandemic, of social reckoning in terms of racial inequality, um, of climate change, um, that we are absolutely living in a time of simultaneities and of juxtapositions. But I think, think that um, our artists who have been working in this area and doing this work and understanding um, what now appears to everyone else to be a kind of convergence that is not coincidental, coincident, uh, coincidental, but there are artists who've been working in this area and understanding the links between climate change, um, racial inequality, um, and care for you know for quite some time and um, my my interest you know in terms of how I presented this 
um, this lecture, um, or let's say this, this presentation, um, goes back to, and this is something that uh, our, our students are reading in the Portman Studio this, this term, it's uh, feminist theorist Tina Camp's theory of practicing refusal. Uh, and that has to do, uh, she refers to artists who use juxtaposition, layering, and other techniques to form new kinds of representations that defy systems of representation that have denied blackness in the, uh, in the past. So, you know, one of my sort of interests as, as a writer, and Scott mentioned my book, Architecture, Representation, and Black Identity, um, was opening up and looking at the spaces in which uh, blackness has been erased or not acknowledged or excused, and that we can say in the art historical canon, but also in terms of architectural history, you know, and you know, you know, going from our you know, earliest architectural survey courses, um, which denies that there was you know anything of worth on the continent of Africa in terms of architecture. And it was all architecture is only thought of as a kind of European thing. And, and what I'm interested in is uh, finding, you know, since that system did not recognize the representation. So re looking at Tina Camp's theory of practicing refusal, this presentation was, let's say, refusing those traditional modes of architectural representation, although you did see some plans and some sections. You know, we have to use some plans and sections representing our work, but also thinking that plans and sections don't tell the whole story, that there are other narratives, that there are other subjectivities to this work and bring in those other subjectivities. Okay, Mara, thank you. I'm, I'm going to dive into some, some, some questions here. Um, and I think this might be from a, a student who's in the Portman studio with us this semester. Uh, your presentation had the essence of uh, Arthur Jaffe's piece and the refusal of time piece. In those pieces, there was an intention to make the, the, the viewer feel uncomfortable. Do you take the same approach of moments of confusion, discomfort, layered with architecture to, to, to help achieve a, a sense of quote unquote awakening? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I would say that uh, it's not so much about confusion, maybe discomfort, uh, but the discomfort is a discomfort about uh, to question uh, the nature of the assumed ideal subject, that Vitruvian subject, you know, which is you know, predicated upon that subject is uh, you know, by certain, you know, one of the uh, certain means of architectural representation, for example, the construction of perspective, um, and uh, that ideal subject, that Vitruvian subject, you know, which is a European white male subject, you know, is not universal. It's anything but universal. So in terms of creating discomfort, perhaps I am interested in making that subject uncomfortable in order to recognize, as I was saying in my previous answer, in order to recognize and, and in order to bring about other subjectivities or other ways of seeing. So in terms of drawings, and you saw some of our analytical drawings for that last project, which were mappings of filmic space, you know, we're trying to find other ways of representing space, other ways of, of drawing space. So it is not necessarily to create confusion, but to let's say, find alternative systems, alternative ways of, of understanding, and alternative ways of seeing, perhaps seeing first and then understanding. Thank you. And so just to, uh, to, to that student, I will also say, um, and that's what we're kind of looking for in this first exercise that you guys are engaged in, in terms of looking at the artwork and how you're going to uh, pull it apart and uh, and draw it or rework it, if you will, in some kind of drawing, which may be a drawing that you've never seen before, a drawing that you've never made before. 
Mario, there are a few questions here about uh, performance. So let me put two together here. Um, first of all, a compliment. It was a beautifully crafted lecture. Um, first, can you talk a bit about the performance piece that bookended the presentation? And could you speak more generally about how performance art and specifically the pieces you reference can speak to how we occupy or respond to buildings in space? Sure. Um, well, as Scott mentioned in his introduction, you know, I'm always talking about space. Um, and in combination with always talking about space, uh, the students may hear me in a crit always talk about architecture as being about the event, um, not necessarily the, uh, the static condition of, of the object. And so I'm interested in, you know, the idea of event space and also that program is not static. Uh, that program um, is about how, not only how we occupy space, but about how we, um, and I don't mean this in a kind of performative sense, but how we enact our identity within a space. Um, so uh, event space then leads to performance, which then gets us to think about architecture as something which is dynamic rather than, than static, something which we think about in terms of the body moving through space, the body uh, being in space, the way that the body gets choreographed as it moves through space, as it occupies space, as it enacts daily life in space. So the, the use of performance, and let me be a little bit more specific, I've been collaborating now for the past couple of years with uh, Jonathan Gonzalez, who's a choreographer, and you saw Jonathan performing uh, this piece um, in the courtyard. This is, that was actually at Columbia University. Um, that we worked on together for this piece called Working on Water, the original Working on Water. And Jonathan and I are both interested in alternative modes of representation and how we think about architecture that moves beyond the, the image of what architecture looks like, but to begin to think about how architecture performs. Um, and so my work has been moving or tending towards uh, performance for the last few years. So um, a couple uh, related questions here. Um, generally, uh, what is your understanding of the role of architecture in the erasure of blackness in certain spaces, such as during segregation? And then I would just put it in context more generally here. There were a variety of different images um, that can be interpreted as a part of the black experience in America. There were also images of architectural concepts. How do you interpret the blend between black identity and architecture? I'll be careful with this answer. Um, I think that blackness, and I don't mean race, but blackness has always been present in architecture. Blackness has always been present in time. Um, the piece that you uh, heard tonight was uh, a compilation of excerpts from, and some of you I'm sure recognized a few of them, from Interstellar, of course, the Christopher Nolan film from several years ago, um, uh, Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time. And in particular, um, there's a passage in Brief History of Time, a section called Black Holes Ain't So Black. And in that Stephen Hawking, as he's describing a black hole, and I recited it for you uh, this afternoon, you know, he analogizes a black hole or the event horizon as being like trying to escape from the police, but never ever being able to get clear away. Uh, and the first time that I read that several years ago, I was like, whoa, um, Stephen Hawking gets it, you know, if you will. Um, so I would say that 
blackness as a conceptual condition you know, of the other in order to um, allow you know, a certain subject to claim power or to claim supremacy has always been, been present. And again, I'm not speaking about race only, uh, that it has always been present in order in the construction, if you will, of, in the construction of power. And um, I think that architecture in a number of ways has been complicit um, in the construction of that order, in the construction of regimes of power. So going back to Vitruvius's uh, uh, tin book where he analogizes you know, his subject, the uh, European male subject, the symmetry, the perfect proportion to that of a temple, you know, is the embedding, if you will, of a certain subjectivity uh, at the uh, denial or benign, uh, and maybe not so benign, uh, neglect of other subjectivities. And uh, so I'm, I'm also interested then in undoing or unlearning, if you will, the, the whiteness of the ideal subject, thinking about blackness. Thank you. You know, Mario, one thing that I, I, I miss is the opportunity to have you in person here during the semester, uh, given our pandemic. It's one of the most special things about the Portman semester. And part of that is sharing our environment with you and uh, you know our school and our city and the changes happening here. Uh, but that's okay, we'll figure that out. Uh, this question is about Atlanta. It says, what thoughts do you have on Atlanta's urban environment in relation to cultural influence in the world? Um, well, uh... Let me just start by saying uh, I grew up in South Carolina um, in uh, a town called Orangeburg, about three hours and 20 minute drive from Atlanta. So when I was young, Atlanta was the Mecca. Um, it was, uh, you know, and is, of course, you know, the, the home of Morehouse, Spelman, uh, Ebenezer Baptist Church. Um, I have relatives who live in Atlanta. I lived in Atlanta um, during the summers when I was an undergrad at Clemson and interned uh, in Atlanta. You know, this was 30 something years ago. Um, so uh, Atlanta has always held this kind of special place for me in terms of you know, the culture of the city um, in terms of its architecture and um, and I continue to be fascinated, if you will, by the evolution uh, the evolution of the city, particularly now as let's say uh, and this is you know pre you know this last election, but particularly now as you know more and more let's say cultural, and these are perhaps more sort of popular cultural sort of things like movie studios and other things have now sort of come to the city and you have shows like, like Atlanta, um, the you know, Donald Glover show, which is, you know, trippy and mind blowing. And I think operating in this space that I'm you know, very much sort of interested in, which at times seems surreal, kind of juxtaposes lots of sort of things. Um, so I think that there's, you know, I think there's something going on in Atlanta that, um, you know, to be mined and that there are artists and creatives there, you know, doing some really interesting work. Okay, here's an interesting one. How do you approach opacity and visibility of meaning in your work? especially in academic contexts where there might be multiple quote unquote gazes at play. Yeah, first I think that um, 
I am interested in uh, the construction or unpacking the, the opacity to understand that that opacity might be constructed of multiple layers. Um, so it's not truly opacity, uh, opaque. It actually might be dense or it might be thick, but it's not necessarily opaque and that there are layers to be uh, unpacked. And simultaneous to that, then I think that um, meaning is not singular, but it is plural or multiple, and that multiple meanings can exist simultaneous, um, which doesn't, that's not an argument for um, relativism or, uh, or uh, subjectivity, um, but it's just that understanding that multiple meanings may exist and they do not necessarily cancel each other out. So, and this perhaps this goes back to that very first question about simultaneity and juxtaposition. So how do we understand, you know, the, uh, you know, those relationships, those orders and the, those networks? So, you know, as I sort of, you know, sort of think about sort of meanings, meaning is not just a, a, a point, but it is perhaps a constellation of points that form a kind of nebulous cloud or, or vector network, if you will. Okay. Um, I'm gonna preface this question with an observation. You know, one of the really um, just pleasurable parts of this performance lecture presentation sharing was the, the, the deep dive into artwork that is clearly at the center of your your personal gaze and you find interesting. And I thank you for sharing uh, so much of that. This question uh, is, is rather, you know, more straightforward, but in the context, I would say, of that artwork, this person asks, what architect's work do you look at that inspires you? So who are you looking at right now? We know who you're looking at for art. But it sounds like this person wants to know who are you looking at in architecture. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll maybe I will answer that question uh, indirectly, um, just to give a little bit more background to um, my own thinking about art in relationship to architecture and I suppose you know the architects that I continue to be interested in um, are architects who are you know also interested you know in art in certain ways so well, um, Scott mentioned um, my having worked for Stephen Hall for a while and in the office of Zaha D um, and you know many of you may know that they're both painters or Zaha was a painter um, uh, Stephen is a is a painter. Corbusier was a painter. Um, Stephen continues to do watercolors every morning on um, five by sevens. You know there are thousands of them now. Um, and when I was working in Stephen's office, you know every Saturday afternoon, because we work six or seven days a week, Stephen would say, "Lunchtime, go out see some art for a couple of hours. Come back." And we'd sit around and talk about what it is that we saw in the galleries. This was every Saturday. Um, so that has, so art has actually always been part of my practice. So you know, I suppose in terms of architects that I've been interested in have been those architects for whom art has been part of their practice, like, I don't know, Herzog and Demeron, for example, um, you know, for whom art has you know, played a major part major role in their practice, you know, the work of, of uh, Gerhard Richter, for example, in Herzog and Dimron's work. Um, but that to say at this very moment who I'm looking at in terms of architects, I don't know if I can name anyone because I don't know if architecture, if architects, if we're doing what we need to be doing just yet, or what I think we should be doing. I won't say need to be doing. 
but maybe what we should be doing. I think for me at the moment, the art world is actually much more interesting than the architecture world. And uh, we could have a much longer discussion about that. I could give you my critique about you know, the profession. Um, you know, hopefully if I'm able to make a visit somehow in the, the second half of the semester. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, we have a couple more questions here uh, before we wrap up. Um, and, and you might, maybe you can answer this a bit in the context of what we're doing this semester in, in, in the studio um, entitled Reconstruction. This question is, when confronted with a discipline with such deeply embedded whiteness and the societal effects of this, how can we as members of the architectural community work to not only identify, but meaningfully work to dismantle these biases? Yes, I mean, I think that um, simultaneous to, um, you know, to doing our work, that is, you know, our design work, um, advocacy, um, what have you, is also unlearning some of know what we have learned uh, uh, in the you know, in academia and in the profession um, uh, last summer uh, several colleagues uh, faculty and myself at Columbia um, we wrote a statement called unlearning whiteness um, we didn't want to write about um, race or we didn't want to write about blackness, or we didn't want to, we did not want to write about uh, racism or injustice. We actually wanted to, let's say, flip the script to say the work that really has to be done is the work of unlearning whiteness, not just listening to what black people have to say about racial injustice, um, but actually doing the work from the other side. And I think that it's really important for the profession, and it's difficult, but for the profession to, to do that work. Yes, the profession may recognize that, you know, the numbers of licensed architects of color, you know, is less than, you know, 20%, less than 10% or what have you. The number of women of color who are licensed is less than that. The number of uh, people of color, uh, I'll be more specific, black people, brown people in architecture schools is you know, dreadfully low. But I think we have to ask, but that is in relationship to what? To And I won't call it white privilege, but let's call it white advantage. And so how do we unlearn white advantage and the systems that have constructed white advantage, those systems that we take for granted, or that, I would say, that are taken for granted. I think that's a great place to, uh, to conclude. Um, Mario, I thank you for this great lecture and your meaningful answers. Uh, Scott, if you're, uh, if you're there, I'd invite you to, to come back on if your camera's still there. Yeah. Um, sure. Feel free to to wrap up for us. Thank you. Great. Thanks, David. Yeah, Mario, thanks, 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 thanks again so much. Um, um, well, I have a bunch of questions, and I, but I, we'll have to have another, <laughs> another discussion. Uh, but I, I, I just, I really appreciate uh, you sharing your, your work in such a unique format that, that, and I, and I actually, actually, it's really telling and, and kind of interesting to me that the question thread you know, started with a question mark and then ended with a deeply considered question. I mean, as people started to really understand and kind of internalize what you were trying to do. Um, and uh, for me, it, it, you know, it does go back to, to, you know, what I have seen in your work, you know, throughout your career, which, which it's always been challenging in, in the best sense of that word, you know, that you've always challenged uh, conventions and you've, you've always challenged uh, canons. Uh, you've always challenged, you know, how architecture is represent, represented, what 
is included in architecture. I mean, I think if anything, you can look at this performance that you did and it's just a multi-layered kind of uh, flow of issues that contextualize and are part of what we do as architects, but we often don't look at it. We just ignore it. And so I, th I think for, 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 for um, uh, that, among many other things, to me, it's just it's super powerful. And it really kind of opened, opened my mind uh, uh, to, to just to, to, to kind of start looking and thinking uh, more deeply again. So anyway, uh, thanks so much, Mario. Uh, uh, great, great show. And I look forward to seeing you around campus in some form, either digital or uh, uh, in person. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. Looking forward to the rest of the semester. Great. Okay. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you uh, next week at our next event.